Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you. I'd like to welcome all of you to worship this morning and uh, invite those that are in the narthex uh, to come on in. We're going to begin our worship service here in just a moment. I want to welcome you with a few announcements and an opening and, and prayer before we begin the music. And uh, first and foremost, and this is just a really, really important announcement, is I'm going to invite a special announcement with Pam Williams and Bobby Kavalewski. So come on up, Pam and Bobby. I'll give them a second. <laughs> Let me give them a second. I want to announce that shoe boxes, those doing Operation Christmas Child boxes, the Operation Christmas Child boxes are due. I am. I'm going to wait just a minute because these are important. The shoe boxes, Operation Christmas Child boxes are due back October, uh, November 9th. Wednesday, November 9th. Right, Wendy and Kevin? Wednesday, November 9th. So please get those shoe boxes back. Fill them up. We still have more back there. We put out more this year than the past years. And they are going, which is great. So shoe boxes due back November 9th. Now I'm going to invite Pam Williams and not Bobby, but Greg uh, with a special announcement. Pam Brothers. Sorry, Pam Brothers. <laughs> Thanksgiving Day here at church. There are cards in the back that you can pick up. Some are on the welcome table, some on the little table by the cross. Pick up some cards, give it to some friends, neighbors, whoever, anybody that doesn't have somebody to eat with is welcome to join us on Thanksgiving Day. And doors open at 1230. We start serving at 1, or opposite, open at 12, and we serve at 1230 until 2. So they can come, anyone who doesn't want to eat alone, just bring, you know, if you have a spouse or whatever, bring them, and you just need to call the church and tell them how many are coming, so we make sure we have a place for everyone. And then we're going to be asking for turkeys a little bit later, and bring your turkey to church is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and we're going to ask for desserts to be don donated on Thanksgiving Day, too. Thank you. Thank you, Pam Brothers. Pam Brothers and Greg Sager for doing that. Uh, uh, special announcement. The Thanksgiving dinner is just always such an important ministry with Bethel, and I'm so appreciative for those that volunteer and serve there and those that attend as well. The other announcement I want to share is that Judy Stevenson, Judy Stevenson is with us today in the back with Dr. Bob, her beloved, and so it's good to see you today. She hasn't been able to come to church but about once a month uh, for some time dealing with different health issues, which we've been praying for, and it's also good to see Diane Young uh, today. So, and last announcement, then we're going to go to prayer, is that we have a, a lunch today right after the worship service. Um, I'll buy all your lunch uh, right up in the fellowship hall. I know it's not Chick-fil-A, but it's going to be good. Up in the fellowship hall, come on for lunch in honor of the Gideons. We're going to have a Gideon speaker here in a little bit. Um, Lee Hawkins and with his wife Polly are with us today. They just shared in Sunday school, and I'm greatly appreciative of them. And we're, they're going to be here for lunch with us. On that note, I would like to go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Let's pray together. Dearly Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to gather for worship. And Lord God, as we pray together, we just certainly invite your presence. We know, Lord God, that you're present with every believer in Christ. You're present with every believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit within us. But we, Lord God, we just ask for a special sanctifying, a special setting apart of the worship service. And Lord God, as we not only begin the worship service right now, we also take time to pray for one another. 
I pray, Lord God, for those of our congregation who are sick and dealing with different things. We thank you for Judy Stevenson being with us today and Diane Young. And we pray for Diane's continued healing. We pray for Judy's healing and strengthening of her legs. I saw her walk right in, uh, very little issues, like no issues. And we thank you for that. Strengthen her and, and be with Judy. We pray for the Wall family, Adrian and Cheryl and Brian, who have COVID right now. Please heal them. We lift up Lisa Fink. We continue to lift her up as she continues to battle back intense, severe back issues. It's like every time she gets better a little, she gets worse. And we pray, Lord God, for your healing power upon Lisa. She's seen the specialist. She's seen the doctors. It's not working. Lord God, I pray that you would intervene and you would heal her. Encourage Lisa. Encourage Carl as well. We lift them both up to you. Lord, we pray for Marilyn Nolder and Jerry. Marilyn with the brain bleed as well as the COPD. And, and we pray, Lord God, for your healing power upon her, your comfort and care. And, Lord God, we lift up to you... Uh, Rich Robertson, as he continues to heal from COVID, now at home. And Cindy Wells, dealing with fluid retention, that you would heal and encourage her. And we know there are many others dealing with different physical health issues right now. Uh, Marilyn and Jerry Nolder's daughter, Wendy, uh, Wendy dealing with uh, <clears throat> breast cancer. There are others, Lord God, dealing with uh, whether it's cancer or Alzheimer, dementia or autoimmune diseases or other sickness or illness or job issues, and we lift them all before your throne. We lift up our military men and women. We thank you so much for them. Our EMTs and paramedics and police and firefighters, our first responders. But, Lord God, first and foremost, we thank you, Lord God, for the spiritual need that you've met. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look what is new has come. The old has gone. The new has come. You have set us apart. You have sanctified us. You are growing us up in you. You've adopted us into your family. You've regenerated us. Actually, that began in the, in, in the beginning of our salvation, regenerating us. You've baptized us with the Holy Spirit. You've declared us righteous, justifying us. You've done so much for us in Christ. And how can we keep that to ourselves? Give us a burden to take the gospel to other people. At Bethel, friends, give us a burden to take the gospel to other people. That we are sharing the gospel with everyone and anyone we can. Help us not to be discouraged, Lord God. We can't convert people. You do. All we do is talk about what you've done in our lives. We pray for one another. We, we hand out Bibles. Give us a burden to share the gospel. We worship you, Lord God, in spirit and in truth. You are our amazing Lord God. Be glorified and be exalted as we worship you here in just a second. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the worship team. Kevin, Wendy, could you up, come up, please? Good morning, everybody. Oh, man. As, as most of you are probably aware, this October is... Pastors Appreciation Month, and we're required by law to give them a little gift, so <laughs> not really. Anyway, we appreciate these people more than just this month of October. We appreciate them all the time. I'm hoping you we got, we've been blessed with great leaders. So, and, and where's her, could you come up please? Like I said, uh, just a little gift for thank appreciation. You so Wendy, thank you very much. And uh, Tim is going to give a little prayer before we continue. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. It has blessed us in this church with leadership. We ask now that you bless this pastor and his family. Our leadership with Kevin and Wendy. Let your hand be upon them and your face to shine on them so we can go forth with your work and your will and pass the message to the dark world that we live in. Let us be bright lights, for the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Yes, yes. 
and the path of the righteous is as the light of dawn. Let this pastor and his family, Kevin and Wendy, guide the paths of those that are placed in front of them for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. On behalf of the pastoral staff and Kevin and Wendy, I just want to thank Kevin and Wendy for their continued service here and thank the congregation. You are certainly a blessing to serve. Now I'll turn over to the worship team. Let's all stand and give honor to the Lord today. Tell them how much we love him. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound. today. The battle belongs to the Lord. No 
weapons of death is against us for stand. Welcome, Victoria, to our praise team today. Thank you for singing with us, Victoria. Uh, Steve and Joyce had to be away today, and they're allowed for that. And <laughs> it's good for Steve and, uh, and, and Joyce to have a Sunday off and travel and such, and because uh, they faithfully worship every Sunday. So we brought in uh, Victoria to sing with us, and we're so grateful for her willingness to help lead us in worship. I want to invite... Uh, Lee Hawkins up. Lee Hawkins shared in Sunday school. He is uh, one of the Gideon's speakers. Uh, Rich and Lisa Farr, also Gideon's from Bethel. Well, Rich Farr is a Gideon, and Lisa's on the auxiliary. And, you know, in October, we always like to focus on missions. And so we did focus on international mi missions in August, having, hosting Avondine Bible. And please continue to keep them in prayer as they are in Ukraine but we thought we'd focus on local missions. And we did that in two ways. A few weeks ago, we had Haley Fall share on Wednesday night about the ministry with the Navigators with YSU students. And now today, we've invited uh, Lee and his wife, Polly Hawkins, to be with us. And he's going to share about the Gideons. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Well, that's awesome. What a way to start out church this morning, isn't it? That was great. Fantastic. I'd like to open in prayer, please, at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you would be with us this day, Lord, and we know that you are in charge of all. Lord, you are our leader. We ask, Lord, now that you would have your word go through us, Lord, this day, and it not be us alone, but you, Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, uh, Pastor Steve had said there just a little bit ago that, uh, you know, we can't do it on our own. We, we cannot do it on our own. God has to be the one to change people's hearts, and that's the only way. But through the Gideon's organization, we give out Bibles to those that do not know him in different countries. We, we uh, reach out to over 200 different countries with Bibles in, in over 97 different languages, and that uh, is only done because of you, the church. We can't do it without you. And the reason is, is because the, to purchase the Bibles, it comes through you. And you are a direct result of the Gideons because we, we ask for your donations to be able to purchase those Bibles. And there are many uh, different uh, testimonies that we could talk today. Um, I'm just going to keep it limited because uh, I just want to show you a video here in just a little bit. But uh, as God has told us through the Bible and... Isaiah 55, 11, that so shall my word go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but shall do that which I please. And that's a promise to all of us 
that God's word will reach out to all those that do not know him. And we ask now that through uh, this local area of cells, as I said earlier this morning uh, in a Bible study, that uh, we had given out over 12,000 different Bibles just in this area alone. And to uh, the different colleges, YSU, Akron, uh, Kent State, uh, through different uh, fair, uh, Trumbull County Fair, the Columbiana County Fair, the uh, Canfield Fair, we gave, gave out Bibles in those different institutions there. And it's only because of you that we can do this. And it's just amazing to see all the different uh, people that come and want to accept God's word. And that you can tell by the looks on their faces that they're, they're ready. God has got their hearts open to his word. And I want to thank this church so much for letting me be here today. And I thank Pastor Steve as well for allowing me to be here. We do have a video that I'd like to show. And I'll let uh, Pastor Steve take it from there. Thank you for being with us. And go and start that video, Ken. Children may be dismissed to junior church at this point, and we're going to be going to we're going to be going to Acts chapter 19 in a moment. And I just want to thank uh, Lee and Polly for being with us. Hope all of you can stay for the 
luncheon today and talk with them more and learn how to support the Gideons more. We took a love offering as a part of the Sunday school offering, and that's going to the Gideons. And uh, we got about $160. If you want to donate to them and you haven't got a chance, uh, you can always donate through the offering boxes or the, uh, or the general offering that way, and we'll and just mark it for Gideons or see me or right after the service, and we'll get it to them as well. I want to mention a few other things before we dive into the sermon, and they both relate. Uh, in my first year here, we focused heavily on evangelism. And we need to always, 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 always focus on the gospel and focus on evangelism. We still have these boxes up here on the, um, right under the prayer altars, which is prayers for salvation. And we have people put in names of loved ones or friends, coworkers, colleagues, hopefully they're still loved, who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we want to pray for them. We continue to pray for them. You know that angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents? Heaven worships when people are saved. We have a major election coming up in a week and two days. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, November 8th. Elections are important. Definitely vote. But what's most important is that people need the Lord. People need to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I really, really, really hope and pray that we are praying for our lost family members and friends praying that they're saved. And then I really hope and pray that we are ready and willing, looking for opportunities, praying over our bre- uh, praying under our breath, even as we talk to people, oh Lord, give me an opportunity to talk about the gospel. Give me an opportunity to share Christ. Give me an opportunity to share Jesus. I know sometimes we expect the opportunity to come as a dove flying down saying, talk about Jesus, and it doesn't always work that way. Start talking about Jesus and see how receptive they are. If they aren't receptive, quit it. You're pushing too hard. Don't want to do that. If they are, keep talking about Jesus. Sometimes we're discouraged because we think if, if we talk about Jesus, we're a failure. If, they, if it doesn't end with them praying the sinner's prayer. Well, first of all, the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. It was invented in the 1800s. Nothing wrong with praying a response to the gospel, but... Um, somebody's saved in their heart, not by saying magical words. It's not an incantation. Second of all, sometimes people are planting seeds. And God brings somebody else along to water them. Sometimes we're planting the seeds and that's it. Sometimes we're watering the seeds that somebody else planted. Sometimes we are the ones who get to experience, after the seeds have been planted and the seeds have been watered, we get to experience them come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we just need to have God's space in our conversations with people. We need to have spiritual conversations. Don't focus always on getting to the end, getting to them receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Obviously, that's what we want. But focus on having a spiritual conversation. Spiritual about Jesus, not about yoga or things like that. Spiritual about Jesus. Focus on having Jesus-centered conversations with people. Be ready to be used of God. That is the ultimate need of our society. That is the ultimate need of Bethel friends. As we think about the church and the church health, we we have to think about, are the lost getting saved? Are the saved being discipled? Or are the discipled changing the world? And I ultimately, ultimately believe the church is a mission. That is, you know, the Great Commission, which is Bethel Friends' mission statement. Go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, he'll be with us always, even to the end of the age. We're called to be a mission. Acts 1.8, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Oftentimes, we want the power of the Holy Spirit for ourselves, not to go share the gospel. If you want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, step outside of your comfort zone and share the gospel. That could be giving Bibles out like the Gideons do. It could be praying with somebody else. It could be talking about totally gospel-centered conversations. But that's when we experience the power of the Holy Spirit. When we step outside of our comfort zone, we trust him to be witnesses to other people. And I have to apologize because I think the last couple years, I haven't focused enough on evangelism. And that's going to change. I know I did in my first year or two here. And I don't like being the bad guy but I don't think we've done a good job. And one chief goal, chief job of a leader is to 
show reality. What is reality? The reality is across the United States of America, we have not done well with evangelism. We've lost a whole generation. The millennials, which are not in their 20s anymore, they're around 40, 7% claim to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. What does that mean for the next generation? Dr. Tom Crawford, the executive director of Evangelical Friends Eastern Region, said it's going down to 4%. 96% of them die without Jesus and are living without Jesus today. And God wants to use you and me as his instruments to share the gospel. But we'd rather talk about the football game or Halloween, which we're going to get to in a minute. And I have to be honest, oftentimes I like talking about football games too. So do both. Say, look, both teams are praying in the sidelines that they win. Who's God rooting for? The Steelers today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Use every opportunity to bring up the gospel. Seriously, you could talk about it. Look, they're praying. Use that as an opportunity. Look at that sunset. Point to God. Point to Jesus and everything. And start by praying for the lost to be saved. And that's why I want to spotlight those boxes. Somebody rightfully brought up to me. I haven't spotlighted them. And if you have lost family members or friends, put their names in there. Because, you know, oftentimes through the week, I haven't done it recently, but I will be again. As I walk through the sanctuary, I pray over those boxes. And I hope, I hope that even if you're at home, you can say, Lord, you know who's in the boxes at church. We want to pray collectively that they are saved. That's first and foremost that we're praying. Secondly, and th- this, this is going to tie into the message. Today's Reformation Sunday. That means that we celebrate that on October 31st, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the doors in the castle at Wittenberg, which I believe is pronounced Wittenberg in German. The 95 Thesis, and that just shook the world. And the 500th anniversary was, 15, uh, was 2017. Uh, he did that in 1517. And we're going to close the sermon, the service later on in a few hours. Uh, with a mighty fortress is our God, a great Luther in him. And I'm so grateful, and I hope you are too, that Martin Luther, you know, God used him to bring on that reformation. And that moves into spiritual warfare, which we're going to get into in Acts 19. I totally believe the church is under attack. The church has always been under attack. The devil is on the prowl. Peter writes, he's a roaring lion seeking those he can devour. I had a professor of worship in seminary, uh, in seminary at Asbury, theological seminary, who said he thought Martin Luther was, you know, so uh, bold. It was like he was standing in a river saying, you're going to turn around because I'm not moving, <laughs> you know, and he changed the course of, of history, and God used him for that, and I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of spiritual warfare going against him, and I believe the spiritual warfare is going against the church today, too. It relates to what I just talked about with the gospel. Angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner repents. That means the devil doesn't want people to be saved. And I think one of the worst things that we do is we deny the spiritual realm. The first Christian college that I attended was Indiana Wesleyan University. Indiana Wesleyan University. It took three colleges for me to finally graduate. That was uh, the second college, the first Christian college, uh, following a community college. And, and one of the classes I enrolled at was Old Testament Survey, Old Testament Survey. And I loved that class. Uh, professor Coulter was the professor, and he was the teacher of Old Testament, but he was also a pastor. And I, I, I know some of you have probably heard this story once or twice, but it's worth repeating again because it applies to what we're going to get into today. One day, I don't know how it related or if it related or if he got off subject, but he talked about one, one certain day when a woman, a mother from his congregation called him and said, uh, Pastor, can you come over? Something happened at my house last night and we really need your help. And so he started making his way to her house and on his way he stopped and picked up an elder from his church, which is obviously very wise when you hear what happened. And the elder used to be a pastor as well, so he had pastoral experience, a called elder, and they go over and they see this woman and her son who's about 17 years old, a teenage son there, and he says, what happened? And the 17-year-old said, well, my mom works nights, and last night she wasn't home, and we had a group come together, a group of friends, and we tried to raise a demonic spirit. We tried to raise a demonic spirit. 
And uh, Professor, Pastor Coulter said, what happened then? And he said, the boy said nothing. But later that night, his mom's at work, he's home alone. And he wakes up in the night and he sees some entity at the end of his bed telling him to do just horrible, horrible, horrible things. Professor Coulter said, what do you do then? And he said, hid my head under the blankets. And eventually he went back to sleep and the thing went away. So he said, we want to pray over you. The pastor and the elder want to pray over you. He said, okay. And they said, we want you to get on your knees. Get on your knees for the prayer. And his voice literally changed. Deep growl, grumble voice. Why do I have to get on my knees? And they said, it's submission to God. He did not want to get on his knees. They said, we'll pray over you anyways. As they prayed, when they mentioned Jesus' name, he fell down on his knees. They prayed over him, and they, after they prayed over him, they found out he had gotten into a cultish type stuff when he was around 12 years old. So about five years earlier, he had got into it. They had a huge fire in the backyard, burned it all. He accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. The elders of the church prayed over him the following Sunday. We're going to see an example in this scripture passage here in just a moment where they did just that. These people left their occultish lifestyle in the book of Acts chapter 19 and they burned all that stuff. They got rid of it. You know, they got rid of it. What do we do with this stuff? When we, when we turn our life from, from the old way to Jesus, what do we do with the old way? What do we do with the old stuff? Do we still hang on to it with closed fists or do we say, I'm yours, Jesus, and I'm going to let it go? When we get into stuff of the spiritual realm, and everything's really spiritual, but when we get into occultish, demonic stuff, we are getting in way over our head. And I'm fearful that far too many Christians do that. Today we look at a passage dealing with spiritual warfare. I've been preaching on the difficult times that we face. And today's message is not a topic that you submitted. Today I got to choose. Today's passage is specifically about spiritual warfare. And I have to say, I'm preaching this message on this date because of Halloween, which is tomorrow. I'm sickened by the evil in the world. I'm sickened by it. And I'm more sickened by the Christians who embrace this type of evil. Christians are entertained by things that we should not be involved in. When I was in high school, my pastor uh, drove a missionary around. It was around Halloween. And he drives a missionary around. He sees all these major Halloween decorations. I don't know if you know, but even at that point, it was the second most spent on holiday next to Christmas. And the missionary said, he noticed all the decorations, and he commented with something like, in the country in which I serve, Christians would not be involved in this. When they are saved, they leave this stuff behind. Now, I want to make a disclaimer. I did not grow up in a church-going family. But even in second grade, we had biblical values to an extent, but we didn't go to church, which could mean we didn't have biblical values. Because biblical values should mean a, first and foremost, major commitment to the body of Christ, especially this beyond Christmas and Easter and beyond once a month and beyond uh, even Sunday morning. But we had some world, uh, Christian worldview values. And I remember after Halloween, breathing a sigh of relief, thinking, I'm glad this is over. Still, I enjoyed the old Disney cartoon about Ichabod Crane with Bing Crosby doing the song. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yet even that could play tricks on my imagination. And maybe there's a case for some of that fun type stuff. I'm not saying it's all, there, there's not a case for uh, fun little um, imaginative things. But I do not think Christians should toy with Ouija boards as I did. I do not think Christians should toy with Ouija boards as I did. We are getting in over our head. I do not think we should watch Dracula movies as I did as a child. I think since we thought it was okay because it was in black and white. I think that made it more scary. I do not think Christians should go to haunted houses. However, I do think there is nothing wrong with some mystery. There's nothing wrong with sci-fi. 
But we do not want to venture into the dark spiritual realm. Strange ghost story type shows like that. No. Listen, there's no such thing as people with unfinished business on earth. It's appointed for man and woman wants to die and then face judgment. When we get into that stuff, it is demonic. And it's evil. Somebody called in to Dr. Adelnick on Open Line on Moody Radio yesterday about people who try to communicate with the dead. Psychics. I like what Dr. Michael Van Lanningham, who used to be on the Moody Radio as well, once said, that his brother called a psychic line once, and the psychic uh, said, Hi, what's your name? Can I have your name? And he said, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> You're the psychic. It seems like most of it is fake and, you know, a, a sham, and then others are just totally, completely demonic. We do not want to get into that stuff. Again, I'm not trying to say that there's not a case for fantasy, such as the Lord of the Rings series or the Chronicles of Narnia, and maybe even Harry Potter. This is not an endorsement of it. It's just uh, neutral. I don't know. It could depend upon you. I will make a statement about Harry Potter. When it first came out, my church in high school and college was totally against it. Then I go to Cedarville University, the third college that I went to, which I eventually finally graduated from, and I found out professors would watch it with their kids. And then I was a youth pastor, and... As I'm a youth pastor, one of my, uh, we were at a soccer game, and one of the parents said, it's like those churches that are against Harry Potter. And I said, well, there's a reason for concerns about Harry Potter. And uh, so when I was driving to seminary, she just loved Harry Potter. She started giving me the CDs to listen to on my way to and from seminary. So I would get to Asbury Theological Seminary after listening to them, thinking, you know, I should at least find out more about them. And I would... The CD case is next to me, and before I went into classes, I made sure I covered up those CD cases because I did not want other students or professors walking by and seeing that. I know there's a case for fantasy, but we have to be really prayerful and really careful with this. Paul's in Ephesus in Acts 19, and he encounters false religions. I want to look at this passage, and I want you to see that spiritual warfare was real then, and it is now. I'm going, to, I'm going to read the passage, and then I'm going to let you watch the youth ministry act it out. So last night, they had 17 kids here. That's really awesome. 17 youth here, and we took advantage of that many students here. Victoria was a reader, and they just spontaneously, no prep, it's a spontaneous skit, they spontaneously acted out. I want to read it first, and then Victoria will read it. You'll hear her reading it in the video, but it'll help you maybe understand it more once it's read first. So you'll get to hear it twice. The sons, uh, seven sons of Sceva, Acts 19, 11 through 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. This some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Notice that. I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. They were not Christians. They're impersonating an officer of Jesus. Verse 14, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit, the evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon all of them. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled or magnified. Also, many of those who were new believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them. They burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. They got rid of it. They burned it. They left that behind. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. I'm going to invite Ken to go and play this video of the youth acting this out. And Billy, we might turn the sound up. Acts 19, 11 through 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, 
I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven people of the Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man who, whom the evil spirit leaped on them mastered all of them and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. <laughs> so I don't know if you noticed that. Thank you, and my thanks to youth ministry. I used a book once working with children's ministry called Spontaneous Melodramas. You just read it and have them spontaneously act it out, and that's really what we did. So on my side, I should have said this before, were the seven impersonators, the seven sons of this Jewish high priest. And on this side were the people possessed, and they overpowered them. The people possessed, and we're going to look at this more as we go through this message, the people possessed overpowered the impersonators because they really didn't have Jesus. There's an extra lesson there. You don't want to go anywhere without Jesus. Much less in, encounter the spiritual realm, the demonic realm, and try to cast out demons without Jesus. So I'm going to look at, I want to look at what led up to the spiritual warfare event. Notice verse 11. Keep the text in front of you if, you if you would. Verse 11, the passage talks about all that has been going on. Many people have been healed, and Paul has done miraculous things. Or should I say the Lord has been doing miraculous things through the apostle Paul. Verse 12 tells us how far things have gotten. They take handkerchiefs and aprons from Paul, and they touch other people. When, when these handkerchiefs and aprons touch other people, they are healed. Also, the evil spirits would leave the person. So this verse recognizes that this had to do with physical healing as well as demonic possession. The demonic possession is gone, and the physical healing happens as well. Before we move on, understand that this is not a type of witchcraft, not at this point. This is uh, God working through the Apostle Paul and God doing other miracles through the handkerchiefs and aprons and things of that nature. There are two other occasions in the scriptures where something like this occurred. One is Peter in Acts 5.15. Acts 5.15, even Peter's shadow would pass before people and, and things would happen. They'd be healed. And, and then also in Luke 8.44, in Luke 8.44, when a woman with an issue of blood came and just touched the edge of Jesus' cloak and she was healed. It wasn't the cloak, it wasn't the apron, it wasn't the handkerchief. It was the Holy Spirit. It was God working in those things. All of these incidences bring glory to God and not to man. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. Later in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Any spiritual gifts, anything like that, any ministry must point to Jesus. It's not supposed to be about us. It must be about Jesus. So all of these incidences bring glory to God, and we'll see that as the narrative goes on. By the way, one thought I have to say is I think that Luke must have had some fun writing up this narrative. I find it humorous. I find it poetic justice. I find it irony. Here these people are trying to impersonate a true apostle. They don't even know Jesus. And God allows the demon-possessed man to overpower them. Now, God allowed that to happen. God could have stopped it. God made a statement, and because of that statement, many, many, many people were saved and got rid of that old stuff that they were involved in. So that's what's going on to lead up to this. They're in Ephesus, and Ephesus is full of witchcraft. One writes, Ephesus was reputed as a center for magic. The famous statue of Artemis, the centerpiece of her temple, was noted for the mysterious terms engraved on the crown, girdle, and feet of the image. Referred to as the Ephesian scripts, this magical gibberish in Ephesus on this statue, this magical gibberish was considered to have great power. It was not by accident that Paul's encounter with magic took place in Ephesus, nor is it a surprise that his converts there had been involved in such practices. Magic was part of Ephesian culture. Nor should one question the integrity of these Ephesian Christians, who only now... Openly forsook, uh, openly forsook such ways. Salvation involves a process of growth, of increasing, uh, increasing spiritual growth. And after all, the Ephesian spells were not that remote from the horoscopes and board games that supposedly communicate telepathic messages with which many Christians dabble in our own day. 
This is Ephesus, center for magic and things like that, and it truly was demonic spiritual magic, no card tricks and things like that. So in the next few verses, we see the imposters. Jewish people are faking and impersonating Paul. From readings, I know that it was common back then to have exorcists who went around trying to make a name and money for themselves. They were shams. They were fakes. And this case is no different. These people were fakes. They were imposters. They were not real. It, it, it's a big deal to fake who you are, right? My dad was a police officer before I was born. He still had the uniform in the closet. When I was a real little kid, my brother and I would try to get him to put on the uniform. And he said, no, 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 you can't do that. It's, you cannot impersonate an officer of the law. That's a big deal. Well, if it's a big deal to impersonate a, a police officer and a, an officer of the law, it's a bigger deal to impersonate an apostle called by Jesus. To, and, and one could even go even further and say it's a big deal to impersonate any Christian trying to cast out demons when you don't even know the Lord. They didn't even know the Lord. They didn't even know Jesus. More than one set of men are doing this, but the Bible gives us one example. In verses 14 through 16, we see this, this case study, this example. Seven sons of Sceva. So Sceva is their dad, and he is apparently a Jewish high priest. Now, there was a Jewish historian named Josephus, and he, and he wrote in the first century, a Jewish historian, he wrote in the first century, and he gave a list of the high priest, and Sceva was not on that list. So it is possible that maybe this guy is a pagan high priest, not a Jewish high priest. It could be that he was an illegitimate, an illegitimate, illegitimate high priest. It could also be that he was from the high priest's family, but not the actual high priest. It could be that, again, he's just a fake. There are different options. But think about this, though. The high priest is the only one to enter the Holy of Holies in the temple and make sacrifices. And think about that with what this happens. But to his credit, maybe this supposed high priest did not know what his sons were dabbling in. I mean, later, if you go back to the Old Testament... 1 Samuel chapters 1, 2, and 3, you see that even Samuel, the prophet and the judge, his sons were pretty bad. Not Samuel, um, Eli. And then Samuel's sons were not that good either, we find out later. So it's quite possible that, you know, maybe his sons just rebelled. Maybe he's a good guy. We don't know. We just don't know. So his sons impersonate Paul. And they try to cast out demons in, in, in Jesus' name, impersonating Paul. The demons talk through the man they possessed, okay? The demons are talking through the man that they possess, or actually the people they possess. They talk, and, it, it become, and they become supernaturally strong. And the demon says, Jesus I know, Paul I am familiar with, you I don't know. The demon beats them all up. And sends them all on the street naked. Now the translation might have missed something. The Bible says that the demon beat them all, all up, which is all seven sons. However, it could also be translated two. So it, sometimes numbers are hard to translate. It could be two, not seven. Uh, it also, when it says they were thrown out the street naked, uh, it could also mean with just torn clothes. They may not have been totally naked. I do want to say, I, remember I, uh, remember I was on a mission trip to a Native American reservation. And one of the missionaries talked about how some of the kids, uh, the teenagers, the young adults, they were probably more like in their 20s, would get involved in some of the Native American, uh, basically like witchcraft type, medicine men witchcraft type stuff, and they would come home just beat up. And they were uh, beat up because of the demonic stuff they got involved in. What's happening here? The word spreads. Verse 17 says, the, the Jews and Greeks see this, both Jews and Greeks. And it says, the name of the Lord was magnified or extolled. That's what we are here for. We are here to see the name of Jesus magnified, the name of Jesus exalted, the name of Jesus extolled. That's, that's what happens to this. And many people are saved. Verse 18 says, of those who believed, they now came out and they, <clears throat> they confessed their sins. And what this really means is they got rid of their occult stuff. See the next verse, next verse. They take them out on the street and they burn them. They have a big bonfire getting rid of this stuff. 
In verse 20, says the word of God spreads. Look at this. It's in the city of Ephesus. They're trying to share the gospel in the city of Ephesus. Paul's going from city to city in the book of Acts doing riot evangelism. He'd preach the gospel to the Jewish people. They would get upset, throw them out of the temple. He would go to the Gentiles. The people would still get upset. They would have a riot, try to kill him. He'd have to flee, but the word of God would spread. He would go to another city, repeat cycle. <laughs> I have to say, if I'm beat up and, and stoned and left for dead, as happened with the Apostle Paul, I get a vacation day. But not with the Apostle Paul. He would get beat up, persecuted, stoned and left for dead, and go to another city and preach the gospel. But look at this. Paul did not have to preach the gospel and the people were saved. You ever realize that? These people impersonate them. The demon does not come out at that point. People see what happens. The word of God spreads. People are saved. God doesn't need us. He chooses to use us. So what do, you, what do we do when we are saved or set free? Do we get rid of the stuff of our past? Notice that spiritual warfare is real. I shared the story in the beginning of the message. I've not experienced anything like that, like what Dr. Coulter experienced. I have had go to go through and pray through houses and, and do things like that before. Do you know that witchcraft is growing by 25% in the United States? We do not want to get in this stuff. They love Halloween. They love to do things on Halloween. It is a sacred holiday. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with trick-or-treating. My kids will probably go out tomorrow night. It was supposed to rain. I told Mercedes last night I could just go buy some bags of candy, and I'll take my 10%, of course, as tax. I'm trying to, and, and I'll take another 10% for capital gains tax and, you know, so on, and then another 10% for tithe. But uh, she said, no, we're bringing an umbrella. It's supposed to rain. I'm not saying that that is wrong. We've got to beware. We've got to beware of the costumes. We've got to beware of what we get into. We've got to beware. Ephesians 6.12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a spiritual world that is alive and active. The devil will bring Christians down any way he can. Some of it's through getting into Ouija boards and occultish things and demonic stuff and, and, and witchcraft and things like that. And, or maybe it starts innocently. We're just going to go to some uh, graveyards on Halloween night and see what happens. And that's, not that that's innocent. Maybe it starts with things like, uh, like um, haunted houses and things like that. But it escalates, it escalates, it escalates like a drug. Maybe for other things, people, maybe for others of you, the devil gets you with pornography and lust. We're saved. We've got to get rid of what we get involved in that's of the devil, that's of the world, that's of sin. We've got to get rid of it. We don't go back to it. These people in Ephesus, they had a huge bonfire getting rid of it. And I know I focus for most of this sermon getting rid of the occultish or demonic or spiritual stuff like that. Maybe for some of us it's getting rid of pornographic videos or bad letters or other things that we shouldn't have. We get rid of those things. Jesus saved us from this stuff. And when Jesus saves us, we are set free. When Jesus saves us, why would we want to go back to it? Why would we want to go back to this stuff that Jesus saves us from? One writes, two lessons emerge from the story. For one, Christianity has nothing to do with magic. The name of Jesus is no magical incantation. The name of Jesus is no magical incantation. That's what's going on here. They're using the name of Jesus as a magical incantation. That might be similar to a football player putting Philippians 4.13 in his little eye makeup, whatever that's called, just thinking that that's going to make him play football better. That's not what Philippians 4.13 is about. You can look it up later. It says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Yeah, make a touchdown. That's not what that's about. Read it in context. That would be using the name of Jesus, using God's word like magic. The name of Jesus is no magical incantation. The power of Jesus drives out the demonic, and his spirit only works through those who, like Paul, confess him and are committed to him. Second, the demon did confess the power of Jesus over him. Look at that. Notice it. He says, Jesus I know. 
the demon, the demon speaking to the man says, I know Jesus, but you're not of Jesus. He beats them up, throws them on the street with torn clothes or naked. Compare James 2.19. James 2.19. Even the demons believe in God and shudder. It's not enough to just believe in God. We've got to bow our knees to Jesus and make him Lord and Savior of our life. Many who are easy, believer, easy believism. The people of Ephesus recognize this, and they extol the powerful name of Jesus as a result. What was true of them is still true. In the name of Jesus is all the power needed to drive out the demonic forces in every age. One other lesson here. I've already kind of inferred about it. It's making Jesus Lord of our life. We do not want to go and pray over people who maybe are dealing with spiritual warfare or, or even dealing with sin if we do not have a vibrant relationship with Jesus. doesn't mean you're perfect. None of us are perfect. But it means we have an active relationship with Jesus. We're active in our church family. We are active in the spiritual disciplines. I remember talking with a professor in college. He was a missionary to Nepal. And I asked him about spiritual warfare. He said in Nepal, they even have names for the demons. What you need to know, as a Christ follower, as somebody who knows Jesus as Lord and Savior, as somebody who has Jesus within them, as somebody living with Jesus, you are possessed by God. You are possessed by the Holy Spirit within you. Matthew 28, 20 is about that. Put on the armor of God. It's Reformation Sunday. I've talked about spiritual warfare. I believe Martin Luther certainly wasn't perfect, but he had the Holy Spirit within him. There's no way that he could go against the corruption that he did without the Holy Spirit within him. And God used that to spark the Reformation. There were already seeds at work in it, but he used that in mighty, mighty, mighty ways. We're going to close here in a moment with A Mighty Fortress is Our God. My favorite, or one of my favorite hymns next to In Christ Alone, and a few others. But first I want to ask you, do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? I'm not asking if you made a commitment to him with some prayer 50 years ago or 20 or 10. I'm asking, do you know him? Are you in a relationship with Jesus? Are you organizing your life around Jesus? Is he Lord of your life? Either he's a Lord of all or not Lord at all. Are you surrendered to him? Some of you are a believer on the sidelines. You're not, you're a fan of Jesus. There's a book, not a fan. It changed my life as I thought about it. Jesus calls us not to be follower, not to be fans of him in the stands, but followers of him on the field. More than followers, he calls us to live in a relationship with him. Are you in a relationship with, he, with him? If you're kind of a fan on the sidelines, you're not really making him Lord of your life, today make a commitment to make him Lord of your life. Some of you maybe have made him Lord of your life, but you've strayed. I encourage you, come back to Jesus today. Angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. Some of you have never made a first-time commitment. What does it mean to commit to Jesus? It means that we confess, we believe, we trust, and commit. Confess we are a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe in Jesus as the one and only Savior. Trust in him and commit to him. Trust in him and commit to him. Oftentimes we stop at belief, but trust him and commit to him. And when you mess up, you repent, you own up to it, you, you acknowledge it, and you keep going. Two steps forward, one step back. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the cross. I thank you so much for the gospel. I thank you so much that we really do not need to have fear as Christians. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the Holy Spirit within us. But also, at the same time, we don't want to go back to the things that you've saved us from, that you've set us free. You've set us free, and when we are set free, we are free indeed, free to live for you. Free to live for you, Lord. Lord God, we face struggles and and things like that in this life. Help us. Help us persevering in the faith. There's a spiritual realm, living and active. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 shows, and the word of God shows. We wrestle not with flesh and blood but with the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly realms. Lord, help us to put on your armor. The belt of truth, truth is from your word. The breastplate of righteousness, we have Christ's righteousness within us. The helmet of salvation, 
Oh, Lord God, thank you for the salvation you freely bestow upon us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. There are feet planted firmly with the gospel of peace, the, the, the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit within us. Oh, Lord, help us to walk with you, live with you. And if there's anybody here who needs to rededicate their life to you, they've strayed, may today be the day they come back to you. Some here may be believers, but they're not really committed to you. Same thing, may they make you Lord of their life today. Some, I'm sure, really don't know you. May today be the day they confess, believe, trust, commit. Confess they are a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe in you as the one and only Savior. Trust in you and commit to you. And may they respond in a simple prayer like this. The prayer doesn't save, it's what, they, what they're saying, it's their heart. Lord Jesus, I confess I've sinned and missed your perfect standard. I believe in you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again. Today, Lord, I am trusting in you as Lord and Savior. Today, Lord, I am committing my life to you. Please come into my life and help me live for you. And we know that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. If God has said anything in your heart, as during this closing song, the altars are open. Come forward and pray. And um, we have people, Elda and Rachel and Tim and others, would be glad, glad, glad to pray with you about anything that's on your heart. And um, right after the service, you're all welcome to join us at lunch. And Bill's going to close, when he closes the service in prayer, he's going to pray for the meal. Let's all stand and sing this wonderful hymn, The Mighty Fortress. Father God, you know, this message this morning is so important because Satan is out with his demons trying to tempt us, trying to rob us from our joy, put fear in our hearts, Lord. So God, I just praise you for this message this morning. We need to stand firm with Christ through the Holy Spirit in our life who conquers evil. And so, Lord, we just ask 
this morning that all of us here will put our trust in you and not allow Satan to rob our joy. And Lord, this Halloween, please protect the children on the streets. There's such evil on the streets as well, Lord. So just protect our kids. And Heavenly Father, we just uh, praise you this morning. Pray that this service and everything we said and have done it honors you, God, for you are awesome. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, Lord, we just pray that you dismiss us with your blessing and bless the food and the fellowship as we follow with this, with this lunch. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.